This is the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, episode number 109. To build a good system of any kind, like a modern content system, it's important to give everyone involved a clear picture of the system before you start designing and engineering it. A content model gives authors, managers, designers, and programmers a shared visual understanding of a content ecosystem before a single word or line of code is written. Rachel Lovinger was one of the first content professionals to develop and teach this important content practice. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 109 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Rachel Lovinger. Uh, Rachel is uh, works now at Publicis Sapient. And uh, welcome, Rachel. Tell the folks a little bit more about what you do there at Publicis Sapient and, um, uh, and how you got into content modeling. Hi, Larry. Thanks for having me. And sure. Uh, so I am a, a group director of content strategy at Publicis Sapient. And uh, I've been there, wow, well, I guess 16 years, um, worked on a number of different projects. The company has gone through several name changes since I've been there. Um, so it's, you know, it, it keeps it fresh. It doesn't feel like it's been 16 years. Um, and, I, and I would say earlier in my career, I did uh, probably a wide range of content strategy type things. And, um, but then probably for the last... Uh, decade or so, my my work has been pretty focused on doing content modeling for clients. Um, a lot of uh, web platform type projects. Um, we tend to uh, work a lot using AEM, and uh, um, I, the developers that I I work with have come to rely heavily on on uh, the content modeling documentation that I help create for these these projects. So nice. it's pretty well, gratifying. Yeah. And you've been documenting documenting this practice as long as anybody, as near as I can tell. You wrote that famous article in uh, in a list apart. That's almost ten years ago now, I think. Um, about where you co- talked about content modeling. Uh, um, I, I forget the subtitle, but anyhow, tell me about that article and how you came to articulate what you were doing as content modeling. Uh, sure. Well, I think. Um... It's funny, actually, before I was even a content strategist, before I heard of content strategy or heard of content modeling, I was working, uh, and before I was at Razorfish slash Sapient slash Publicis Sapient, <laughs> the various name changes, um, I was working for Time Inc. Uh, for a website called EntertainmentWeekly's EW.com. And uh Shortly after I started working there, I was actually uh, an HTML developer and then a front end like template developer. But we were working very closely with the editors on uh, on the CMS and and how they used the CMS. And um, to me, it was really important um, uh, coming from this this magazine heritage and using magazine content. How do we create experiences that were really sort of uniquely digital. And so shortly after I started working there, they decided to do a, a redesign of the site. And um, I, the, the designs that our um, designer was creating were really beautiful, but I kind of wanted to break it down into like understanding better all of the content so we could really get a handle on how we needed to publish it, what the requirements are for publishing it. And so uh, without like knowing it was a thing called content modeling, I started creating this documentation where I I started out with making kind of like very rudimentary wireframes for each of the page designs and breaking down like each thing that was on each type of page. And then for each thing that was on the page, so say there was like a homepage promo tout kind of thing, uh, I I then created a document for each one of those items and I asked all kinds of questions about it. it. It wasn't even what I would only what I would uh, think of now as a content model, but like, what is the purpose of this content? How do we want users to interact with it? How often is the content going to be refreshed? Where's the content for this thing coming from? What are the business requirements around this? Do we need to have advertising tagged to it? Um, 
you know, kind of all, all kinds of questions to just basically understand what is this thing and um, what is its relationship to the, to the content that we were getting from the magazine and really trying to understand, you know, how to make this not just like we've taken a flat magazine and plopped it on a web page, but make it really, um, you know, sort of dynamic and interactive and, um, and, and of course, one part of that was what is the structure of this, this item? What is, what are the elements? It has a headline and a caption and an image and a body and an author and a, you know, um, some relationship to metadata. And so it captured all of those details as well. And I, I can't really remember when I started to think of that as content modeling or, uh, or heard that some, there was a thing called content modeling, but at some point that evolved into, you know, what I now think of as content modeling and became a lot more focused on the, the structure of the content and the, um, and the metadata and the relationships between different pieces of content and things like that, which is really, you know, what I think, uh, I guess I have the luxury now to work with a, a team where other people are capturing things like what is the business purpose of this item and what are the functional behaviors of this item? How do we interact with it? But at the time I was kind of like, just throwing everything I could think of into that document to help myself understand like, you know, what is it? Right. It's almost like you were a super webmaster because that was like a title back then, the person who kind of did all the stuff <laughs> and you were doing it, but at a very, a, a pretty high level and with, and with much richer content than many of the websites at that time. It's funny. I, I think at one point my title was content manager. And then we joked because I was working a lot with content management systems. And so I was like, oh, I am a content manager of content management systems or something like that. Like it was a very <laughs> convoluted title. But yeah, that was at a point when uh, the, the magazine, um, you know, they had a much better handle on titles that aligned with traditional publishing titles. They didn't really know exactly what kind of titles to give people who were working, you know, just primarily on the digital side. Right, especially if you're coming out of Time Inc. and um, their, what, 100-year publishing history. Yeah. They don't know what to, yeah, what to do. Well, that's, um, and so you went from from the, the um, EW.com and, and Time Inc. You, you went into the, the agency world. How did, did that, did, did your practice change much in that or were you still working on kind of the same kind of projects? Uh, well, it's funny. Uh, so that was my my first role working in in agency. But I had um, I had so when I was at Time Inc, I had transitioned from working specifically on Entertainment Weekly to working in a group that kind of supported all of the different websites in a way. And and um, so we worked on different projects. So when I went in. <laughs> Uh, for my interview, I tried to make the case for like, well, you know, I haven't worked at an agency, but I have worked in this group that was a centralized group. And essentially the magazines were our clients. And so, you know, it was kind of similar in that way. And and that they seemed to feel like that was an acceptable, uh, you know, close enough kind of experience. And I think they also, they appreciated my my um, approach to, to content. As I mentioned to you before, I had not heard of content strategy when I went in for a content strategy position. Uh, but when I read the job description, I was like, that's that sounds like exactly what I've been doing, which was really operating in the, the place where, um, where, technology and design and business needs meet around content. Um, and so they'd liked that. I showed them actually those documents that I mentioned to you and, uh, and they, they brought me on. And I think I did um, some of that kind of work early on, but it was also, it was probably a much wider range of things. I, you know, I, I think when you're starting out uh, as a content strategist, it's helpful to be able to to do whatever is needed. Obviously, a lot of content audits and uh, content analysis and, and writing uh, things about opportunities and um, recommendations. And I found myself writing a script for a demo video or, uh, you know, doing taxonomy work, doing tone and voice guides, really kind of um, everything, uh, everything that you might imagine a content strategist might do probably not everything, but a wide range of things. And I think over the course of my career, I 
I started focusing more and more on doing um, content modeling. And I, I really um, became very interested in, uh, I had always been very interested in content structure, but uh, I feel really strongly that having a good content model um, is one of the things that enables us to create a product that where we, can, we realize the design, uh, that we make the design come to life. And uh, I've talked to so many editors back when I worked at, at Time Inc. and then stakeholders later who will say like, oh, I hate our CMS. It's so hard to use. And I'm like, well, your CMS isn't inherently hard to use. It's just not set up for what you need it to do. And so I feel, I feel like um, asking all those questions, what is this content? What is the purpose? What do you want it to do? How often is it going to change? What kind of decisions do you need to make about it? And then using that to inform how you set up the publishing system, that's really like it makes or breaks um, people's ability to sustain the, the vision that you've created with your product. So it's one thing to like launch it on day one and it looks beautiful, but to be able to have something that people can continue to refresh and use and, and publish and update and enhance, you know, for six months later and years later. And, and that's, what's going to make it successful. Yeah. And the way you describe that, I think you're, you've, you've articulated, mo I think, a, a lot of benefits of content modeling and what it does for you. But, you know, I'd like to back up just a little bit. And I hope you can sure. do this because you've been doing this so long. I hope you can extract yourself from all your expertise and give us like a like if somebody cornered you at a cocktail party and said content modeling, that's fascinating. How how would you describe it to them? Well, so it's funny. I'm going to tell an adjacent story, which actually did take place at a, a sort of a cocktail party. It was at a conference. Um, I met uh, Cleve Gibbon, who you've probably, you may have heard of him. Oh, yes. Um, he was, so it was a content strategy conference, and he uh, was a CTO who worked with uh, content management systems a lot, and I was a content strategist. And we got into this very, you know, uh, this conversation, and we were, like, very excited about it. And he's like, how do we get technologists and content strategists working together more to like make these things happen. And I said, I don't know, I guess we got to talk more about content modeling and, and get them to do content modeling. And then we wrote a workshop together uh, about content modeling. And I, I can't remember the exact timing of when we wrote the workshop and when I wrote that article, but they both, you know, they happened around the same time. Um, and uh, just started talking about it a lot more and finding other people who were talking about it a lot more. And now there are several books about it and there's a whole bunch of people that, that speak about it. And it, it's, it's pretty exciting just getting, uh, getting, getting more people on board with using this as a technique and, and hearing the feedback from people where people were like, Oh, this is really going to be helpful. I, I enjoyed that. So I guess I didn't really answer your question though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but I, I got to say, I love that story because when you do like the archaeology of, of content modeling, the two names that come up are you and Cleve, you know, so I, and I had no idea that you had collaborated at some point. So that's just, I, I love how this story is coming together. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but do please define content modeling too. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, I think there's, uh, I actually almost forgot about this too, but when I first was talking about content modeling. I think there's a, a sort of high fidelity and low fidelity ways you can approach it. Um, so, you know, you can get really detailed, but the sort of low fidelity, high level way that you could um, think about it is really just having an understanding of kind of what are all the types of content we have and how do they relate to each other. Um, and And it's basically, like any kind of modeling, data modeling or, or other modeling, how do you um, visualize the system that you're creating? And, and by system, I don't necessarily mean a content management system or tools, but I mean, you know, what is the landscape of content that you're going to want to create? So at a very high level, you know, you could say, well, we're going to have reviews and we're going to have uh, interviews and we're going to have photo galleries, and these things are going to relate to each other in this kind of a way. And so it's really um, at that level, just 
doing some planning to understand the landscape of content that you're going to deal with. And maybe you'll, maybe that includes things like um, the reviews are going to have ratings, but obviously interviews are not going to have ratings. And the uh, we're going to import ratings from other sources and merge them with our own so we can say our reviewers said this, but users said that and things like that. So how do you um, create those relationships between different sets of data and the content that you're publishing. Mm-hmm. So that's kind the, of the, oh, sorry. Right. No. And, but then also, and that's like, and then the high fidelity part would be like the details about all that and the implementation. Is that correct? Right. Or? So the high fidelity is breaking down. Okay. Well, a review comes is, um, sorry, a review is made up of an image and a tagline and a grade and a, body and a headline and a et cetera, et cetera. So what are the, all of the kind of individual parts of that that need to be then captured in your, in your CMS or whatever you're using to publish your site, to publish your content, I should say, not just a site. Yeah. Now I'm curious. Um, are you, have you done much with headless CMSs or, or um, any of the new decoupled architectures? It's funny. Is- it's funny that you said that. I feel like um Having been in this field for a while, I've kind of seen like, like a lot of things, it's sort of the pendulum swings back and forth. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you start out with like very uh, headless type things, although I don't think they called it that at the beginning of the century. Um, but uh, the first like serious CMS that I worked in was Vignette and um, Vignette had a, oh, what do they call it? It was like a CDS, content deployment system. And then you had to build your own CMS. So one of the reasons actually that I got so into working with the CMS is uh, we had built our own CMS and the CMS was built in the same, um, the same language as our templates for the website. And so what we would do is like, we would see that our editors were struggling to do certain things and we would kind of build tools for them that like sat on top of the CMS that could help create shortcuts. So, oh, you want to create a photo gallery and it's very tedious to upload 17 images. We're going to give you a tool that will upload 17 images all at once uh, instead of having to repeat that same uh, task over and over. And so in a way it was because we had that ability to create our own uh, enhancements to the CMS, that was really what got me interested in, you know, how do I, how could we structure this content to create a better experience for the authors to make it easier for them to do the job that they need to do. And, and to me, that is uh, very uh, tightly integrated with the content model, because the purpose of it is to kind of express um, what we want to do with the design with the process in mind that the authors are going to have, that the content producers are going to have to follow to make that content happen. And so having that understanding of like where, where they were struggling and where they were spending a lot of time doing repetitive things instead of like creating interesting content, we really were, were trying to reduce that. So I started out working in, like I say, they didn't call it a headless CMS, but it was essentially a headless CMS because we were creating our own interface for it um, to to, uh, save the content into a relational database. And and then um, later we started getting tools like what I tend to use a lot, um, our projects tend to use a lot these days is uh, Adobe uh, AEM, Adobe Experience Manager. And that is... Uh, an interesting mix of, I would say, like a kind of a very WYSIWYG sort of an interface um, and a and a backend that is meant to be very, very flexible, uh, but, it, but the front end causes it to have this still a very like page oriented metaphor, you know, so it's like you, you can sort of look at it and it looks like a page, uh, but it's not really, but it sort of looks like the page. Uh, And now that has kind of swung back the other way where uh, I think Adobe has probably recognized that people have a need for this more 
uh, what, what we're now calling headless CMS approach. And now they've added features that let you sort of integrate that kind of approach with their page oriented approach. So now we're using, um, we have a combination of using like page templates that look like pages and then other templates that are more uh, functioning as like a content as a service where you're authoring the, the stuff and it's exposing it as JSON or something and then using it in an application. But it's funny because it, it sort of takes me back to like 20 years ago where we were just creating these forms that you're going to fill out all your stuff. And then, you know, it merges with a template somewhere further down. Yeah. No, that's interesting because in some ways that experience to the, to the um, content creator doesn't look that much different. You're filling mm -hmm. out some web stuff. And in one case, it's, it's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence with the ultimate artifact. But in the newer cases, it's could be, you know, show up in five different places in, in different things. How, I'm curious how, how much you've done with, um, with the authoring end of it, like having to educate content creators about, yeah, cause almost everybody came from like that old, publishing journalism school where this was not how it was done. And did you have to do a lot of educating along the way? Um, yeah, I would say what was most interesting to me when we started, um, you know, when I was doing this in the early 2000s, we wanted our, our, so our authors would write keywords for the articles and the keywords were all over the place because it was just an empty field and you could type whatever you wanted into it. And then at some point I, you know, I would, convinced my boss, like, we really need to normalize this and create an actual metadata library and then have like a controlled vocabulary of words that we can update regularly as new movies and books and TV shows come out. Uh, and then you can like tag your articles with this. And I think now everybody's really used to tagging things, but at the time, the editors were like, why are you giving me something else I got to do now? I have to search for a word. And then, you know, we would do things like show them, uh, this is like a big throwback, but like Star Wars, uh, Phantom Menace. There were like 20 different ways that people had written it when they typed it in as a keyword, because, you know, someone would call it Star Wars episode one and someone else would call it, you know, episode one with an I and somebody else would call it Phantom Menace, the episode one, you know, so there were all these different combinations and we were like, look, you can either have this where it's just keywords all over the place, or we can give you a co controlled vocabulary and you can tag it and you have the same thing and it's consistent. And eventually they got used to it, but I think it was also through, you know, people tagging things in, in Gmail or Facebook or you know, other applications where people started tagging things and, and hashtags. And now people were like, oh, okay, this isn't so weird. But yeah, there was a lot of resistance to that kind of thing at first. And, and then, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 I was just going to say that that I'm trying to remember now when like Twitter came around like 2007, 2008, something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's when sort of, I mean, there had been like WordPress and other CMSs had freeform tag fields before that. Um, but that sort of like the uh, popularization of metadata uh, yeah. that's and so that made your that made that education part of it a little easier. It sounds like the, the, the kind of a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. Or, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think now it's it seems easier. Um, uh, a lot of the, the clients that I work with, the, the people that they have who are authoring content, they are hired because they have some experience with, um, with doing digital content entry. Um, but there is still always a, a, a learning curve when we're building new things. And so, you know, we're saying, okay, here's a, a new piece of content that we created. So it's, it's not so much that we have to, um, like they're familiar with the fundamentals of creating content and, and publishing content in a, in a web interface of some kind um, and tagging and, and whatever else. But we, we do find, you know, especially the more complicated uh, kind of a thing you're creating, we can, we give them instructions. And I've, I have worked on projects where, you know, writing in it, 
a user guide or an instruction guide wasn't part of the original plan. And then we hand it over and then later they're like, yeah, we actually really need some kind of guidelines for this. And, and I always try to push for that, if not actual training, at least some guidelines, because, you know, you no matter how hard you try to um, make a system like that be completely self-evident and, and intuitive, there are going to be things that you just have to explain. Yep. And, um, and everybody does things differently. So it, does that documentation have to be customized for each like client or project or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It has to be pretty highly tailored yeah. um, to, to the specific types of content that, 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 that client is going to be creating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just the, um, yeah, there's, there's so much, there's so much in there. I'm almost afraid. In fact, I'm looking at my clock. I'm going, Holy cow, we're well, coming up close to time already. <laughs> so to bring it back to the content yeah. modeling, though, I would say, I mean, one of the, the great things about one of the additional benefits of, of a content model is that um, it's actually pretty easy to take the content model and then pivot that into training um, because you've already right. captured here are all the requirements for authoring, but you've in the content model the primary audience is usually um, developers. You're creating a content model to, as kind of a um, specification for the developers to know how to set it up. And it's it's generally pretty easy to kind of take that and um, just, just change the point of view a little bit uh, to explain to authors how they would then need to author that content because it's really kind of the same information. It's just you know, here you're setting up a CMS and now you're using that CMS, but these are the same fields and the same requirements for what things need to be named and the same, um, you know, uh, possibilities for how things can be associated with each other. So uh, the writing that content model also gives you a jump start on writing a, a user guideline. Yeah, it's like, well, I just remembered the subtitle of your article in the list of part. It was a master model. And so that's like your 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 uh, your boilerplate, or not boilerplate, but like your sort of the top level superset of all the stuff that's mm -hmm. there. And you can use that to communicate with developers, authors, whoever else. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. Well, hey, is there anything last, Rachel, anything that, that we've talked about that you want to elaborate on or that hasn't come up that you want to make sure we get to? Hmm. That's hard to say. There's so many. <laughs> I know. <laughs> There's so many directions to go with this. Um, um, I, I don't. I. I would just say I'm. I'm very uh, happy to see how how much content modeling has uh, taken off. I think when I started doing it, I was like, I'm just doing a weird little thing that you know I need to do for myself to understand how to build this because I was a developer at that time, uh, and so it's been very useful. I mean, it's been very gratifying to, uh, especially when we were like doing the workshop and, and talking with people and hearing them say um, that how they were planning to use it and how they would find it useful. And I think, um, you know, one of the biggest benefits of it that we haven't really covered is just how using content models as a way to start a conversation with the people who can help you figure out what the requirements are um, you know, to create those relationships with people and, uh, get alignment on, on, uh, what it is that we're all trying to do with this product. I think that's, um, that's, and hearing people say, oh, this is going to help me, like this becomes a tool that helps me talk with my developers, talk with my designers about what these requirements are. I think that's the, the thing that's been most interesting to see. I think you saved the best for last there that, because I think that is like a super high level benefit of, of modeling. And um, because it, and we, before we went on the air, we were talking about, uh, I mentioned Jeff Eaton's quote that content modeling is really just the friends you met along the way. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of in that family. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Oh, one very last thing, Rachel, um, what's the best way for folks to stay in touch with you if they want to connect online? Um, I guess through Twitter, uh, I'm just R Lovinger on Twitter, and uh, I probably don't tweet as much as I used to, but uh, but I can always be reached there. So um, yeah, that's well, probably good. Well, thanks so much. Really enjoyed the conversation. Me too. All right, thank you. Thank you for listening. 
If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.